Ah, about the Coastwise project in South Africa. Before we start um, with the presentation, I will say a few words um, to the agenda. At the very beginning, we will have a comprehensive presentation from eight scientists who jointly work in the project Coastwise, improving knowledge for integrated management of the land sea interface in South Africa. And um, this presentation will be around 40 minutes. And after the presentation, we will have around 50 to 20 minutes for question and answers. And um, now I would like to hand over to our partners from the Coastwise project. They will introduce themselves and will provide you with an insight into the activities of the project. Please, Kira, let's dive in. OK, thank you very much, Sven. And thank you, everyone, for joining. A very warm welcome. We're very pleased to be able to finally present the Coastwise project. My name is Kira G. I represent the German partner in the project, Herion, the Helmholtz Zentrum Herion in Gesthacht. Um, also on behalf of my colleague, Andreas Kannen, who unfortunately is unable to be here today. So we'll be running through the um, idea behind Coastwise um, in the next half an hour or so. Um, you can move to the next slide, Charlotte. Um, but I'd like to start by just explaining very briefly what Coastwise is all about. So what are we actually trying to achieve in our project? And the starting point is really that a lot of work has already been done in South Africa that relates to coastal and also marine assessments. But um, the feeling is that um, these processes and also the subsequent processes of, of planning then uh, for um, different uses will benefit from an improved um, and a more integrated way of doing such assessments and would also benefit from a better knowledge base. And so more, um, more detailed, different types of knowledge to be um, included in coastal and marine management decisions at the end of the day. Um, there's also recognition that capacity is still an issue when it comes to coastal assessment and management and also literacy, um, both of communities, but also crucially planners and decision makers themselves. So here we have it in a, sorry, that Charlotte, can you go back? That's the one. <laughs> Next one. That's the one, the lighthouse one. So the idea is, is shown here in a nutshell, really. So um, Coastwise is starting off by trying to identify gaps and needs, really. You know, what do we need to know um, in order to, to have better integrated coastal assessment? And is it possible to use new technologies um, and, um, you know, innovative approaches to, to fill these gaps? And one of such, uh, one of these technologies or approaches is the ecological infrastructure concept which we plan to use um, for the first time. We also want to look more specifically at um, benefits and values that are assigned to different um, coastal ecosystems by local communities and local stakeholders. So one idea is to dive into these human values um, a little more and uh, to try and then capture those in new spatial layers, which can then benefit marine planning. And the last um, part you can see, of course, like all the um, Meerwissen projects, um, a big part of our work is also to, to talk about the solutions um, that we have come up with to design um, communication material, policy briefs, that kind of thing, um, in order to communicate what we are developing, what we are finding. Next one. So here we are. Um, our team is a fairly large team. A multidisciplinary team, so we have um, everyone involved ranging from marine biology to geography to social sciences. Um, some of us are part of more than one institution um, and we'll um, be introducing ourselves shortly um, when we go into a bit more detail um, into the individual work strands in just a second. Next one. So that's what um, today's presentation will be about. We'll be starting off um, with a slightly more background um, and um, introduction stemming from biodiversity assessment, which is being carried out in South Africa and spatial biodiversity prioritization. And then we'll be looking at some of the focal issues in a, in a bit more detail. So that's really, you know, looking at 
the technologies we plan to use, the strategies we're thinking would be interesting and how it then all comes together at the end. Um, and then last not least, we'll also hear a little more about what we're planning for communication. So that's really the roadmap for today. And um, I will then hand it over to Kerry, who will start us off with the first presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, please bear with me because I actually can't see the slides, but I think it'll be fine. I do know what I'm talking about. So I am, as um, as Kira said, the lead of the marine program at the South African National Biodiversity Assessment, and I lead the marine component of the National Biodiversity Assessment. So I have a slide that explains the National Biodiversity Assessment, um, and that really shows that what this assessment about is about is to bring together all of the available experts and science and synthesize this to, to, to be able to report on the state of biodiversity and then to take that from knowing what the state is to make recommendations, policy and action recommendations. We have priority actions, which are one of the most important endpoints of the National Biodiversity Assessment. And so uh, more than 70% of the participants are from outside of Sanby, but we really bring these people together to report on our state of biodiversity. Um, next slide. So um, hopefully this is a slide that is showing you that we actually do this work in four different environments or realms. So that's the, the land, the terrestrial side, the freshwater environment, our rivers and wetlands, our estuaries and our marine environment. And Coastwise has supported and is supporting advancing this in an integrated way to report on the state of the coast. And um, so you should be able to see our coastal assessment uh, framework. So there's a slide that shows the land, the sea and what's the coast, okay? And our colleague, Linda Harris, who will follow me, she did a fantastic piece of work that she led us through that, that provides South Africa's first ecologically meaningful map of the coast as a cross-realm environment. So the relevant parts of the land and the relevant parts of the sea, and of course, all estuaries that fall into the coastal system. And you'll see many of them are offshore, like our offshore mud habitats and those offshore environments that are dependent on, on, on the land and the freshwater systems. And this is really important for two reasons. The one is that we've got a really distinct audience. So at, at multiple scales, so municipalities, coastal municipalities, the provinces of South Africa and government uh, use the coastal assessment. So we need to, to pull this out and be able to report and put those priority actions forward at these different scales in our coastal assessment. Um, and there's that distinct audience. So that's why we need to do this. And, and when you're doing this assessment, working across these different environments, there's, there's many constraints, but so many benefits. It's really important that we have a comparative approach that we can do this for the coastal zone. And if we don't do this for our ecologically meaningful coast, the very expansive land or sea results will overshadow our coastal ecosystems. So that's important. Next slide, please. So do you see a slide about the key elements in the National Biodiversity Assessment? OK, so yes. the key elements in our assessment include a strong focus on the benefits of biodiversity. We put this up front, like why is biodiversity important um, and particularly in the coast? Then we have classification and maps of ecosystem types and Coastwise is playing a key role here in advancing coastal ecosystem classification and mapping. You'll hear about it from my colleagues. We review and map pressures on, on our ecosystems to be able to report on condition, particularly in the marine realm. There's some differences across the different environments in this work. Then we assess ecosystem condition. Um, let me see. Yes, we have our headline indicators. I'll explain now, and that's ecosystem threat status and protection level. We also cover invasives and climate change. We report on the state of indigenous species and genetic biodiversity, not, a, not really a core aspect of Coastwise. And then really importantly, we take this and we distill our key findings 
And from there, we workshop our priority actions linking back to those key findings. But importantly, we also emphasize knowledge gaps and the National Biodiversity Assessment provides a national scale, high level overview of the key gaps that limit our assessment. And that's really helpful because the National Research Foundation and other funders can go back and look at what kind of work do they need to fund to address these gaps. Next slide. I think it's about the, the headline, the headline ecosystem threat status and protection level indicators. So I was saying that the key elements are firstly the map, the map of ecosystem types in the marine realm. By way of example, now we've got 150 marine ecosystem types. We use cumulative pressure mapping and we've got about 40 layers that um, that speak to cumulative pressures. We relate these to our ecosystem types. To, to, to assess the ecosystem condition and then considering the different categories in alignment with the new IUCN framework for assessing ecosystem threat status. In other words, ecosystem red listing, we can report on ecosystems either being um, in, a, in a good state and, and therefore not threatened to vulnerable, endangered or critically endangered. And then by looking at how much of each ecosystem type is protected, Using a spatial layer of protected areas, we can report on protection status. Um, we can really see then how we're we doing in terms of a representative protected area network. Next slide. So the key elements that Coastwise will support in this is really coastal ecosystem um, mapping. We'll be, of course, building on the biodiversity benefits, those headline ecosystem uh, e ecosystem status indicators will be in there. And then, of course, that last piece on priority actions, knowledge gaps, and, and our key findings. Next slide. So this slide uh, will explain, I think, that we, we really, um, what the contributions are for Coastwise to the next National Biodiversity Assessment. So it's bringing in some young new professionals and um, got new people who are going to be helping map fluvial fans. It's already supported some work on kelp forest mapping. And what we're really hoping to achieve is to better integrate our assessment at the land sea interface. So those nuances of how the threat status of the estuary might interface with the threat status of beaches or the offshore environment. Um, and then altogether, we'll be moving forward our assessment and mapping. We'll be piloting new methodologies for integrated assessments, so new approaches, and, and Maya will talk to that as well as, as Lara, Miriam, and, um, and Megan. And then we're going to have a better framework for decision making. And then finally, taking this through into communication, we have some new ideas. We're going to pilot video policy briefs and then through our ocean literacy initiative that Robin will speak to some new content. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank That's you very brilliant. much, Kerry, for starting us off. And because we don't have much time, I'm going to go straight on to our next presenter. That's Linda. Linda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kara. South Africa is in the process of finalising its first national coastal and marine spatial biodiversity plan. This is a spatial plan for the natural environment designed to inform planning and decision making in support of sustainable development. And the Spatial Biodiversity Plan comprises two things. The first is a map of critical biodiversity areas and ecological support areas, or a CBA map for short. And this um, comprises three main CBA map categories. The first is protected areas. The second is critical biodiversity areas, which are split into type one and type two where CBA2s are irreplaceable or near irreplaceable sites and CBA2s are best design sites. And then the third category is ecological support areas. Protected areas are managed according to their gazetted management plans, whereas the CBAs and ESAs are managed according to a specific management objective. For CBAs, this is to maintain the sites in a natural to near natural state. And for ESAs, this is to maintain the site in at least a functional state. We develop a CBA map using systematic conservation planning, and we specifically use the software MarkSan 
together with guidance from the technical guidelines that have been developed. And into MarkSan, we input a number of biodiversity features and design elements. And this includes data on ecosystems, as Kerry has spoken about, um, on species, on things like culturally significant areas, which we'll hear about more um, in, in Megan's talk, um, and so on. So it's, it's a number of biodiversity data sets that go into this plan. The second part of a spatial biodiversity plan is the sea use guidelines, and these provide the management recommendations for the different zones in the CBA map. And the CU's guidelines are compiled based on an activity compatibility assessment with the management objectives in the CBAs and ESAs. So activities are classified based on the severity of the degradation that they cause and the scale of that degradation. And then they are evaluated against the management objectives. So for example, in the top left corner, activities that would or could result in severe or very severe degradation over broad areas this is or not compatible with the management objective to maintain the site in a natural or near natural state. And therefore, we would say that this activity is recommended to be prohibited from CBAs. We have taken all of the activities that happen in the coastal and marine space and we evaluate them according to that um, activity compatibility matrix. And collectively, this then forms the sea use guidelines. There is a direct relationship between the National Coastal and Marine Spatial Biodiversity Plan and the emerging marine spatial planning process in South Africa, where the CBA map categories um, on the left, those are being put forward as the proposed biodiversity zones for the marine area plans, and the sea use guidelines are then informing what the recommended and proposed um, management regulations are within those different zones. And there still needs to be a lot of stakeholder engagement and negotiation um, around this. And there will be continuous updates um, iteratively between these two processes. If we consider the planning domain for the National Coastal and Marine Spatial Biodiversity Plan, new planning was done only in the blue areas. So this is the coastal marine space and the oceanic space. And the land-based priorities, including for estuaries, came from the existing provincial plans that also include fine scale plans for some of the metros. But what's really important is that we get alignment between the land based and the marine priorities um, in especially in that coastal zone. So we made some attempts at this and we use some design elements to try and get alignment um, in the marine space with the existing land based priorities. And there are some places where we did very well. And you can see, for example, that there are places on, on the landward side that are adjacent to um, CBAs um, on the seaward side. However, there are also some areas where this is not very well done. And for example, we've even got protected areas on the landward side that have got no adjacent marine spatial biodiversity priorities. Further, if you look at the gray outlined grid that over, overlays this map. That was the size of the planning units that we used, and this is a one minute grid. And while this was very good for offshore planning, if um, the closer we get to the coast, and especially on the shore and the land, you can see that the resolution in spatial prioritization is very, very different. And we need to do um, improve the planning across the land sea interface by doing by by reducing that resolution and making it making it higher. Sorry, yeah, re making the resolution higher rather than reducing it. And then um, another thing is that estuaries have not been included consistently in the land based plan. So different metros and different um, provinces have used different criteria for including the estuaries. And we need to bring the estuaries into the CBA map framework um, consistently at a national scale. So through Coastwise, we want to produce the first national estuary CBA map. We want to refine the national coastal marine CBA map for the coast, particularly by doing higher resolution planning. We want to do planning across the land sea interface, and not just trying to align with the existing terrestrial priorities. And we want to include new data, especially the data that will be developed through the Coastwise project that we'll hear about from the other speakers. And importantly, we also need to ensure alignment of the land and sea use guidelines in biodiversity, coastal biodiversity priority areas. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Linda. Fantastic. Um, that leads on very nicely to the next part of the Coastwise journey, so to speak. So this is when we dive into some of the more specific techniques um, and um, approaches that we'll be using to do the work just described. So I now hand over to Laura. Thank you. Um, I'm Laura van Niekerk at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, and um, I lead the Estuary Realm Assessment and Reporting. And my job in this um, project is twofold. Um, I'm going to be assisting Linda in integrating the estuaries into the CBA map. And then with a colleague of mine, um, which is not presenting today, Marie Smith, we're also going to be looking at um, the marine fans and plumes. Next slide, or I can see if I can move it from this side. Let's see. Um, did my slide move on? No, you can only move it for yourself. Um... OK, can somebody please move it to the next slide, which has got the high resolution. Thank you. Um, so looking at one of the key things that we were um, going to be looking at in this system. Sorry, I think I moved one slide too far. Uh, sorry. Um, yes, that one. Sorry, that one. Go back. Sorry, OK, um, so one of the key um, things that we're wondering about is the river dependent ephemeral transitional zone systems, which is not very well understood in South Africa. And um, we are concerned with the behavior and fate of fresh water coming into the near shore environment. And what you see there is the Nzimvubu plume. That's one of our um, river dominated estuaries. But it's also got a significant signal out to sea. And next to that picture, what you can see there, um, the cross sectional graph is the river coming in from the land, going into our coastal environments. And what you can see at the top is the salinity profile, how the fresh water then floats on top of the marine water. So it doesn't immediately mix through, but it also sparks off nutrient reactions and phytoplankton production. So part of this is that we need to understand when do these ephemeral um, fans and plumes occur and what is their role in the coastal zone? Next slide, please. So why do we worry about these fans and plumes? And as you can see, there's a beautiful picture taken of one of these um, freshwater pulses going out to sea with an incredible front between the turbid terrestrial water and the fresh marine, uh, the seawater, the blue water. Um, Fresh water supplies sediments to our beaches. They sustain our near shore marine habitats. They create turbidity fronts in which certain species would hide, for instance, or hunt for food. Um, salinity fronts, they provide us with dissolved reactive silicates, which is used to build the shells of diatoms and other um, organisms. And also important in some parts of our coast, provide nutrients. They can also have negative impacts in that they can bring pollutants to our coast and especially in bays, which is high retention areas. This would be a concern for us. Next slide. So here I've just created um, a picture of what we intend to do. Um, this is one system that we have the biggest system in the country, the Orange, which drains about 60% of our catchments. And this is a satellite imagery tracking a one in 20 year event over a two month period. And what we learned from this If you go in the upper right hand corner, 17 January, you can see the plume coming out to sea. And then in the very middle slide, the plume actually becomes less in size. And then we found even in April, a whole two months after the flood event, once the winter storm starts picking up, we get rework of the serum. And so we need to understand this whole dynamic and the scale of which it's occurring at. And the only way we'll be able to do this is using remote signals. Next slide. So our intent is at the moment we have in our ecosystems map, we've got some of these habitats um, earmarked already where we think they're occurring based on benthic sampling, but what is not included here 
is actually what is happening to the water column and how do we integrate this picture? Are the fans and plumes that overlay these benthic habitats the same size? Are they bigger? Are they smaller? Um, there's a whole challenge for us going forward how to integrate it into the map and understand these signals. These things will, these findings will also feed into understanding our pressures and hopefully one of the policy interventions that we're trying to um, generate awareness of or advocating for is there's no recognition of the marine environment as a receiving environment for fresh water under South African legislation. So we're also hoping that by being more explicit about it and getting some time series data that we could maybe in the long term address this policy gap. Last slide. Then as part of the National Biodiversity Assessment as well, we um, intend to um, re-establish our ecosystem reference working group and add some new blooded. We've got um, emerging researchers um, and mid-career researchers that we not to need to start integrating into our history reference working groups. We would like to use the opportunity to review some of our pressure data as well and update that or at least start the processes. We've been working with Nelson Mandela, Janine Adams in improving our history habitat data, specifically looking at blue carbon systems in um, carbon sequestration. So we look for opportunities to maybe integrate that. And then finally, um, all of these findings will be fed into both the NBA processes, like update pressures and condition data for histories, but also into the CBA map, where it would help us decide on the rules and how we integrate these valuable ecosystems. Thank you. Next person. Next person taking mm -hmm. over. <laughs> it really is like a journey. So our next speaker, thank you, first of all, Lara. Next speaker is Maya, who will be talking um, about the work we plan to do on benthic images. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you can move to my first slide, please. Thanks. So I work for the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment is a coastal ecology ecologist where I run the Rocky Shore Monitoring Program. So, and I'm coming into Coastwise with one of the challenges we're facing, and that doesn't only concern this program, but I think a number of others as well. So at the beginning of spatial assessments and spatial mapping, obviously lies spatial data and um, spatial data generated generally in surveys. And increasingly, we've been using digital images to capture biodiversity in surveys. So that is, you can see some pictures here. There's a drone capturing seal colony data, some divers taking photographs of benthos, which is the biodiversity on the ocean floor. And for deeper systems, we use what's on the right. Uh, it's a camera system that gets put onto, like through a, a winch onto the ocean floor without divers to capture those deep sea images. Um, so what's been happening, I think, globally is that we have an increasing pile of photographs that needs to be turned into data. And that process data, when I mean data, did it's species or functional group data that we can actually analyze and plot. That process is called annotation. So with all these images needing to be annotated, we're sitting with a huge backlog in many situations, including South Africa's. Um, to analyze those photos with experts who know species, who know biodiversity, um, we would re we require a lot of time and we have actually a short, um, you know, we don't have enough experts as we speak. So, and this time consuming process, you know, is a, one of our biggest bottlenecks in the process of generating spatial data. Next slide, please. So what's the objective of this little project I'm running for Coastwise? It's basically to, to tackle this, this situation and turn what you can see at the bottom, an image, into a spreadsheet with data where you have species on one side or groups, um, taxonomic groups that are genera, for example and their abundance. So you have you know, spreadsheet data, and those you can then use to either visualize, which is um, you know, generating graphs, which we need for our, all our reports, and also generate spatial data. Um, since I'm running the Rocky Shore Monitoring Program, uh, where we're sampling 3,000 kilometers of our coastline, 
I'm sitting on a lot of these kind of date um, photographs that you can see in the bottom left. And we have obviously manually annotated a whole bunch, but there's still a backlog that we work with. We were using those as a pilot project for other um, benthic habitats, so to say. Um, and we try to create an automatic workflow where you can feed in the image and you get out the data or even graphs. Next slide, please. So this is the process. We're just starting. We're just busy with step one um, to generate training and validation data sets. So it's, it's, you know, for any artificial intelligence, that's what you need. A whole bunch of manually annotated photographs by people that the machine uses to learn. And then we use another data set to validate. We're working um, with artificial intellig intelligence experts um, or computer vision experts, really, to help us in a repetitive loop to um, that optimizes our processes basically it's not a first feed it into the computer and it will know what what we get out so but what we're trying to learn here with this interaction between scientists and computer and scientists is marine scientists and computer scientists is what our strengths and limitations are of this automatic annotation and what we can actually get out in terms of benthic um, labeling so you can see some examples here. There's a raw image of a coral reef, similar to what I take for rocky shores. And then we have a person annotating what's on the top right, the different species. Then we have a computer looking at the same image, and you can see this it's picking up more uh, like different things that the human hasn't picked up. And then we overlay them and we validate them, obviously, with the validation data set. So there's a lot of quality control that needs to be done in this process. So that's the longest part. And then once we have um, come up with a satisfying result for all our coast, which has quite a gradient in biodiversity, um, we're building a workflow where we can feed in the, anyone can feed in an image and out comes the data set in the graph. Then we run all the rocky shore images that we have in the backlog, it's thousands of them, through this pipeline. And eventually, we will turn the spatial data from the, around the coast into a rocky shore biodiversity data layer. So that's our one of our products. Next slide, please. That's already my final slide. And so basically, in, in summary, these are the outcomes. Um, firstly, we overcome a bottleneck. We produce, hopefully, near real-time data for the future, for rocky shores at least, as our pilot um, system. Um, we generate new data products, in this case, spatial biodiversity layer. We, in the process, use students to help us with the annotation and also with the machine learning aspects. So there's some capacity building component. And also, more than capacity building, I, I see there's a capacitation for South Africa where we um, have a shortcoming of experts. So we actually develop a tool that you can pass on to say national parks staff and they will have to just feed in images and get out data for their biodiversity reports. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maya. And we move straight on with Miriam Perske, who will be talking about um, new strategies for ecosystem services mapping. Thank you, Kira. Um, next slide, please. So my name is Miriam, as Kira just said. I'm a PhD student at Nelson Mandela University. I'm also associated with the South African National Biodiversity Institute. In my thesis, I try to combine both biodiversity and human needs in the coastal zone of South Africa. Coastal zone, which sorry, am I back? I get an interruption message. You you back now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So yeah, as I said, um, part of my thesis is to create spatial layers that represent ecosystem services in the coastal zone, and that directly addresses research gaps and um, should be that should be covered under the coastwise project. So. 
Um, coastal ecosystems provide a variety of essential ecosystem services, but um, coastal ecosystems and associated services are at the same time under immense pressure and should be protected. Yet the uptake of ecosystem services in conservation plans remains relatively low worldwide and also in South Africa. So there's a need for new strategies to create reliable um, maps that facilitate the uptake of ecosystem services. Next slide, please. Um, so one of my objectives of my study is to identify key areas for coastal ecosystem service delivery by adapting the ecological infrastructure approach. Ecological infrastructure can be defined in various ways. Um, in the South African context, it is defined as naturally functioning ecosystems that deliver valuable services to people. It can be perceived as the nature-based equivalent to built infrastructure. For example, if you look at that naturally functioning beach dune system on the left, um, it protects the hinterland from flooding and erosion. And, and it does the, the seawall that you can see on the right does exactly the same job, only that the ecosystem does it for free. So by framing ecosystem services through ecological infrastructure, um, the focus is shifted from the ecosystem service towards the underlying ecological feature, which facilitates the mapping of ecosystem services and also the integration of biodiversity planning. Also because EI needs to be naturally functioning and it should deliver multiple services, there's a high chance that the underlying, that the the level of underlying biodiversity is relatively high, which also um, facilitates an overlap between high biodiversity areas and ecosystem service delivery areas, which is um, beneficial for the integration and biodiversity planning. Next slide, please. So um, what, what was actually done? I won't go into much detail about or what, what will be done as well um, about the methodological part here. I'll just highlight some, some aspects of it. So coastal ecosystem types are used to delineate ecological infrastructure and multiple ecosystem services are looked at. And then different aspects of the ecosystem services are modeled, namely demand, which is the need of a society for, for a specific ecosystem service, the flow, which is the amount of ecosystem service that is actually mobilized, and the capacity, which is the potential of an ecosystem to sustainably deliver an ecosystem service under current condition and use. Um, the information on demand flow and capacity is then integrated to estimate ecosystem service delivery, and then um, multiple ecosystem services the information of multiple ecosystem services is integrated to identify service delivery hotspots. Next slide, please. So the outcome are several EI delivery maps. You can see one um, on the right hand side. Here you can see the distribution of ecological infrastructure along the South African coastline. Um, the ecosystem service that was looked here was nature-based recreational arts activities and um, the big red bubbles indicate high or very high recreational arts activity delivery and the blue um, tiny bubbles mean very low delivery. And you can see that a high density of ecological infrastructure that has very high delivery of ecosystem service um, of the ecosystem service recreation can be found in Durban and Cape Town, which are also the recreational hubs of South Africa. So um, a quantitative and flexible approach um, is developed that is repl replicable and at var on various scales and in different contexts. And also um, first national scale coastly eye maps are created that are meant to inform biodiversity planning. For example, the um, critical biodiversity area maps that Linda was talking about before. Thank you. Thanks, Miriam. 
So now we move on to the last part of our journey through Coastwise, which is looking at human values and then in the very last um, presentation on communication strategies. So first of all, the floor is yours, Megan, to talk about the human, the sociocultural layers. Thanks so much for that introduction, Kira. I just want to make sure that I'm audible. Am I audible? Loud and clear. Okay, super. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so my name is Megan and I'll be chatting to you about the human dimensions to spatial prioritization and planning component of this um, Coastwise project. Um, so the rationale for this component of work is really based on the fact that, oh sorry, advanced slide please. The, yeah, so as I was saying, the rationale for this component is based on the fact that globally there's recognition that to achieve sustainability and to effect inclusive and socially just ocean governance and marine um, prioritization, there's a need to consider the social dimensions of this um, socio-ecological system within which biodiversity conservation is essentially operationalized. There is also further recognition that um, when stakeholders feel included in marine spatial prioritization processes or any other um, marine conservation decision-making process, the perceived legitimacy of such processes are significantly increased and with that also stakeholder support for such processes. Um, and such inclusion could be affected through, for example, uh, for example, stakeholders seeing um, their values and their priorities spatially represented and considered in decision making processes. So then through the Coastwise project, we seek to define, to identify and then to map culturally significant areas in South Africa. And um, this concept, culturally significant areas, was really designed to assess and to mainstream uh, cultural ecosystem services into coastal and marine planning. So through this um, component of work planned under the Coastwise project, it is hoped that cultural ocean heritage and diverse um, human cultural values will be included in marine spatial prioritization processes in which they have previously been largely absent. You can stay on this slide. Um, so, no, just go, yes, the slide, thank you. Um, so in South Africa, we have um, many fishing cultures, as you will see from this image, and with people partaking in um, diverse um, fishing activities as one moves along our very heterogeneous coastline. And of course, these diverse stakeholders have different um, cultural values, which through this project we aim to better understand and to include in spatial prioritization. Advanced slide, please. Thank you. So due to the strong links between um, fishing practice and cultural identity in South Africa, Fishing as a practice um, can be strongly linked to both tangible and intangible um, cultural heritage. Uh, in this context, culturally significant areas could, for example, include sites used for um, traditional fishing practices. And here, yeah, these values are considered intangible as they really relate to how um, people's identities and sense of communities are, are formed and maintained uh, by their connectivity to the ocean, the ocean resources, as well as the practices that they use. Um, in addition, culturally significant areas could also, for example, include areas important for recreational fishing or fishing heritage tourism. When we then look beyond fishing, culturally significant areas may include um, sites of historic significance, such as, for example, shipwrecks and other sites of archaeological and historical interest. It could also include sites of significant cultural or historic meaning to South African citizens. And then lastly, it may include intangible heritage, 
in the form of um, spiritual spaces. Advance slide, please. Thank you. So essentially the Coastwise research team will aim to define really what this term um, culturally significant areas um, means in, in, the, in a South African context. And as part of this sense making, the team will um, develop a framework drawing on existing case studies and literature out there. Um, and this framework will aid in conceptualizing and classifying culturally significant areas and, and its many dimensions. Um, this um, methodological framework will hopefully enable planners to identify uh, which values uh, are important to people and, and why they are important. Uh, these culturally significant areas will then uh, be identified along our diverse coastline and where possible these areas will be mapped and they will be incorporated into a revised um, national coastal and marine spatial biodiversity plan from where they can really be mainstreamed into other marine spatial prioritization processes. Um, Given the limited time on the project and given the impact that COVID-19 has had on our ability to engage in person, um, the research team is, is, is unlikely to comprehensively map areas of cultural significance. And with that said, it will be really important to reflect such gaps in the research and knowledge and also provide some form of guidance on how certain data sets should or could be used in an ethical manner. And then lastly, also to identify areas for further improvement. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Megan. Last not least, we have Robin to give the final presentation for Coastwise. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about the Mzansi project, which is an ocean education initiative that we started as a way to share more about South Africa's marine ecosystems to the wider public. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so the aims of the Mzansi component are threefold. We hope to firstly inspire a deeper understanding of South Africa's marine ecosystems. We hope that by fostering ocean literacy, young people will be better equipped to participate in decision making. And we have been doing this by highlighting the wonder, diversity, benefits and ecology of ocean ecosystem. Um, secondly, we wanted to promote more equitable learning in South Africa. South Africa is an extremely language diverse country, but resources are often limited only to two languages, English and Afrikaans. This poses a learning barrier for many young people. So in this project, we have been addressing this by ensuring that more than English is covered in our materials and also that resources are freely available. And then thirdly, we wanted to recognize and foster deeper connections between South African people and marine ecosystems. Um, so South African people have deep spiritual and cultural connections to the ocean, and we wanted this project to further connect people to these ocean ecosystems by conveying a sense of wonder to form emotional connections. Can I have the next slide, please? So one of the outputs of this project is a website geared towards high school learners and decision makers. This resource describes what the ecosystem is who lives there, why the ecosystem is important, why we should care for that ecosystem, and then how do we learn more about this ecosystem? And then this section would include a short profile by a young emerging researcher working on this ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. So within this output, our focus on implementing more languages has started by incorporating three additional languages. Um, Koza, Zulu and Afrikaans, which are our coastal languages, to our understanding of what each ecosystem is. And then using non-scientific language, we have described the main elements that define each ecosystem. So in this example, in terms of Sandy Shores, 
It is that the Sandy Shore provides us with so many benefits in terms of ecological infrastructure, has significant cultural and spiritual importance, but is also important for recreation. Can I have the next slide, please? So the coastal ecosystems that we are focusing on in Coastwise are rocky shores, sandy shores, our river influenced muddy shells, um, coral reefs and kelp forests. And then with the hope that through Coastwise, we can expand to other coastal ecosystems like estuaries in the future. So then besides defining what each ecosystem is, this website will also host content for South African ecosystems and education resources that will benefit students, teachers, parents, and the general public. And then in terms of Coastwise resources, it would very much support hosting um, Coastwise outputs like fact sheets and the videos that would then be shared with a variety of stakeholders. Thanks. Thanks very much, Robin. Well, that brings us to the end of the Coastwise journey. Um, appreciate it's been quite a long one because Coastwise is a complex project and um, it's got lots of different elements that hopefully are going to come together beautifully, of course. Um, I also realise there's not much time now for questions, but please do ask anyone uh, of our team members um, if there's anything you'd like more information on, clarification on. Please also put questions in the chat if you want, or of course, um, do contact us after the presentation, we'd be very happy to to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you for very much first, um, Tiara. Um, so we have five minutes left, but I would say that we give us another five minutes um, for questions and answers um, so that we um, don't have to rush through it now. So first of all, I also would like to thank you um, to all of you um, for this fantastic presentation, very comprehensive. So if you have questions, please raise your hand and um, then speak up or type it in the chat. Yes, Birgit, please. You are on mute. OK, now can you hear me? Yes. OK, good. Very nice presentation. Very great work. So I did not quite get. So two, uh, several questions I have. Uh, I did not quite get where you are now. What is the status of the entire thing? What you think you can achieve in the project? And if there is a guarantee that this will be carried on because you have national institutions in. So where the, the timing and uh, so the ambition and everything is fine, and, but I don't know what is existing and what, yeah. Anyone feels like jumping in, please do. I mean, one maybe general thing to say is that Coastwise has had many delays and we've literally only just started. So this is pretty much what we plan to do, what we are really, really excited to, to start with now. Um, but of course, it is embedded on, on lots of work that is ongoing already in South Africa. I'd like to add two points. I mean, I think um, because although the project was delayed um, and has formally started now, we, we, we've actually held our first team meeting to plan improvements in the assessment and also Coastwise made a contribution to our first coastal assessment led by Linda. And then I think um, in terms of the institutions, I mean, what Coastwise is doing is leveraging additional support and bringing in some of the emerging researchers, but it's got um, a long continuity. And in fact, we designed Coastwise to pick up. So, for example, Robin's and Mzanzi project will also formally end, but for coastal work, we'll keep it going now through Coastwise. So I think that the key institutions involved will ensure the long term uh, in perpetuity for, for this work and also the, the biodiversity assessment is our mandate. So we, we have to keep doing that. Thank you. It's a great thing and good luck for a near success. 
Thank you. Are there any more questions? From the participants here? Otherwise, please type it in the chat. Yes, Peter, please. Yeah, hello. I, I couldn't figure whether I raised my hand or not. Sorry. Thank you very much for all the presentations. I'm Peter Maniara from IUCN. I think something that caught my interest is one of the speakers spoke about, I think, tools to help process like different imagery and there was something like citizen science. I, I just wanted to hear more about that because I think that's an aspect that has been explored, especially maybe by the UN in terms of enhancing like monitoring on implementation of some of the SDGs and especially for what I've been working in for a longer time, which is marine plastics. So if the speaker could maybe shed some light on that, I'll highly appreciate. Thank you. I th think that might have been referring to Maya, was it you? Yes, I think part of it, I, I didn't speak of the citizen science implication of the work, but it exists. Um, so, um, we are using imagery that is collected at this stage for coastwise primarily um, in scientific surveys, um, which is basically a very structured type of photograph that you take to a quadrant always of the same piece, in this case, sort of rocky shore, which is marked by a bolt, you know, so it's, it's very structured. But we're actually using the very same approach um, as a citizen science project currently for youth. Um, which I actually was thinking very much links into what, what Robin presented on Zanzi. It's called Limpet it, and currently working with um, high school learners. Where, um, and we are hoping to use the same, you know, I, I, I hope that we get a tool out of Coastwise that can be used by citizens to also generate biodiversity data and also not necessarily only citizens, but also um, for example, national park staff to generate missing baseline data that we have. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd be very curious to hear about the, the um, project you mentioned. Um, is it an artificial intelligence project with analyzing images? So if there's no time now, I'd appreciate if you could send me an email. And I would type my email address in the chat. That would work for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Maybe you can also clarify it bilaterally. Um, yeah, are there any more questions here? To one of the speakers? So, um, if that isn't the case. Sven, there's a question in the chat. Yes. From Sarah, from Sarah Gaines. She's asking if there's any interest or potential to connect to neighboring countries. Linda? Yeah, very good question. Um, yes, uh, there is. So, we are busy with an EBSA projects, the ecologically or biologically significant marine areas, and this is done for South Africa, Namibia and Angola. And although it's 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 not quite directly aligned, but at least in terms of the spatial prioritization feeding into um, marine spatial planning processes, so the component that I spoke about, um, this is being replicated in the other two countries. And so it, although they're not developing CBA maps in the same way that we are, they are developing zones with the same kinds of philosophy and approach as to what we have. And that is also, and that's within the EBSAs themselves. And the, that is um, informing those countries' marine spatial planning processes. And it, they also include many coastal um, EBSAs. And I'll put, the, I'll put the link to our website in the chat for anyone who wants to, to follow up with that. Um, and yeah, so, so there is, that on, on that side and um, yeah um, I, I think there are there are other African countries that are also developing similar products but it's it's land-based at the moment and not necessarily 
um, in C at this stage, but as they, you know, there's there's scope to move it into into the into the C. Lara, would you like to add? Yes. Um, we, we have um, also got a, a separate project, not linked to this, but one of the fundamental starting points for any of these assessments is the delineation of your ecosystem or your ecosystem map. So it's basically a combination of delineating the space on a map and also allocating a type to it. So if it's an estuary, a permanently open system or a temporary open and closed system or a lake or whatever the case may be. So we've got a project at the moment in the Water Research Commission. We realized that estuaries are connected. They're both discrete nodes in the coast, but they're also very much connected to each other. And it's a problem for us that on both our west coast and our east coast, we just stop, but we know similar type systems are occurring in our neighboring countries. So we've got a project with the water funded by the Water Research Commission of South Africa as part of a larger e-flow assessment process that we're going to be seeing if we can start a first for SADC. I think so we, our northern border would be Angola, and I'm not 100% sure. I think it might be Tanzania on the other side. Um, that we'll be trying to do a first delineation of the estuaries and a typology of the estuaries. Very broad, it will probably leave. I've got a lot of the little ones, but just to start off something, and that is something that going forward, once we give it a shot, that we would not mind if there's future opportunities to have regional workshops to refine that typologies. So we've both in Wahomsa and BCC, we've been struggling with the uptake for the estuaries. As usual, they're falling through the cracks. There is neighboring mapping going on in the sea and there's neighboring mapping going on in land, but there's nothing going on in that space. So we'll be we'll be probably in a year from now, or maybe a year and a half's time, be in a space where we would be looking for um opportunities or maybe co-funding or something to take these topologies into the regions, take them to Mozambique, take them to Angola and maybe just workshop your um, your primary your provisional delineation because you need to do that. You need to take it to your experts to make sure you're making sense. So our stuff also feeds into eFlow. So the same delineation we use for biodiversity assessment is actually the same typing we use to extrapolate for flow allocations and also for issue management plans in South Africa. So we've tried to make our fundamental data sets become our primary building block for a whole bunch of different assessments. So it's sort of embedded in a range of things, which also means we will have ongoing refinement then through all these or hopefully through all these processes. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Um, now we are six minutes over time. I would like to close the session um, because um, we also have other appointments um, following. So um, thank you very much again to all to all of you. A really great presentation and fantastic insights into the project uh, development. And if you have any questions, as Kira already mentioned, and and comments, um, and you would like to know to know more about Coastwise, please approach us. So you will find some more information um, on our on our website. And um, yeah, we will also um, write a short news um, article about this um, webinar and um, put it on our website, on the Mervison website. And we have also recorded the session. And um, yeah, if you want to see it again, um, please have a look in the, in the article and you will find the recording. And we will also continue um, the Mervison webinar series. I will keep you updated as soon as we have scheduled the next webinar. Um, and um, yeah, also for those um, here um, who have not yet registered, please sign up. We have a schedule in the MS Teams community. And um, yeah, or send me an email and um, we will figure out the date. And before we close this webinar, I would also like to mention that Mehrwissen is preparing um, a podcast series um, about relevant Mehrwissen topic and also its projects. And Hauke Kegler and Paul Tuda from Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research will be responsible for this podcast. 
and we will inform you soon about our first edition. Um, most probably um, it will be published end of June. So that's it so, so far. Thank you so much and yeah, stay healthy. We will stay in touch and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sven. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.